It is day one of the Rabin travel market, back face to face and record numbers through the door. And the good news is this is the final session, the final say of the day as well. And that's why we get an entire hour. Uh, so thank you very much indeed for being with us uh, here. Hope you are in good voice because uh, I want this session to be as interactive as possible. Uh, don't be shy. If you've got questions, uh, we do have four leaders in their industry with us here today. So do not lose this opportunity to get your questions answered. Why are we here? We're here to find out uh, how Saudi Arabia uh, is setting new global benchmarks for responsible tourism, developing projects uh, that first and foremost preserve the planet and its people. Four industry experts up here for you, discussing the roles of, hopefully we'll touch on sustainability, community inclusion, education and training, the legacy impact that we hear so much about, and of course the Kingdom's broad-ranging tourism vision, underpinned by huge investment, again we'll tap into that one, infrastructure and those large-scale developments that in the future will provide a best practice blueprint for other nations globally. This is the final session of the day. This is Saudi Arabia's blueprint for responsible tourism development. So, uh, who have we put together? Well, as I was just uh, mentioning a few moments ago, it is something of the Fab Four of Saudi tourism with us here today to answer your questions and indulge in a little bit of a panel discussion as well. Uh, let's start with a man who, uh, well, brings over 35 years of international experience delivering large-scale development projects. Previously served as president of Baha Mar Development Company, over 23 years experience at the renowned Canary Wharf development in London, uh, but since January of 2018. Uh, he is the man that has been charged uh, with bringing the Red Sea Project's development to life. Please welcome the CEO, the Red Sea Development Company, and Amala, John Pagano. John, we're going to get you up here, actually. Should we do, we'll do it in America. So if you can jump in here, that'd be great. Uh, the man alongside him needs very little introduction, but he's going to get one nonetheless. He is a true legend of the hospitality industry. Globally celebrated, Fours Cover Visionary and the of the hospitality and tourism industry. An ambassador, a pioneer, a legacy maker, deep aptitude for positioning strategies and iconic developments. He's been a great supporter of sector and its people throughout the years. Uh, formally, well, where on earth do you start? Uh, former uh, CEO of Forbes Travel Guide, former president and CEO of IMG Artists, former COO of Sun City, uh, but to date, absolute pleasure to know that he is here in the GCC region. He is and has been since June of 2018, the founding CEO of Didier Gate Development Authority in Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Please welcome the legend that is Jerry Inzerillo. Jerry's with us here today uh, and taken his place. Uh, who else can we bring to the fore? Well, uh, a man again who brings extraordinary amount of experience to the panel. 25 years experience in the business uh, leading tourism authorities across the world. Uh, he was the former managing director and CEO of Tourism Australia. Other former roles include the director of Lux Group uh, and Voyages Indigenous Tourism Australia. Uh, recently served as chairman of Sealink Travel Group and managing director of Life Media, uh, Media and Events at Fairfax Media down in Sydney. Uh, more recently though, he is the man who is in charge of tourism for NEOM. He's the managing director Tourism Neon, Andrew McAvoy. We've got a very international panel up here, and the man that is going to conclude that panel, our Fab Four of Saudi Tourism. Uh, he has just flown in all the way from the United States to be with us here, so big thanks to him in advance of that one. He's held numerous uh, at tourism uh, roles, management tourism roles, roles across the world, no more so than in his native United States of America, where most uh, poignantly he was the president and the CEO of Visit Dallas in Dallas. Texas, USA, a program that won and garnered applause and awards the world over. For that reason, uh, he is looking to do exactly the same with the stunning uh, UNESCO site heritage of Al Ulla. Please welcome the Chief Destination Management and Marketing Officer, the Royal Commission for Al Ulla. It is Philip J. Jones. Phil, great, th thank you so much indeed for being with us. Uh, we've got the old uh, 
boxing ring, UFC, uh, uh, Pentagon um, uh, introductions out of the way, and we dive into conversation. Can't thank you all enough for being with us here today. I know you've all traveled far and wide, so thank you, and for giving us your time on day one of ATM. And I want to start, if I may, with a little bit of, can we start with the definition? Because um, I looked at the title of this one, Saudi Arabia's blueprint for responsible tourism and development. Now, we've had ecotourism, we've had green tourism, we've had sustainable tourism, now we've got responsible tourism, there is the possibility of regenerative tourism. John, can we start with you and work our way down? How much of a fan are you when it comes to phrases that guide tourism in this field? And how much conversation is going on with the other partners alongside you? Well, look, I think, and thank you for having me, and uh, it's great to see so many faces in, in the audience and great attendance at ATM. Look, I think we, we've been leading the way in the change in the narrative away from sustainability. I think, you know, I say sustainability is no longer enough because sustainability is, can be simply described as not making a mess of the place or I also like to describe it as rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. At the end of the day, we need to be doing things differently in order to move forward and actually to undo the damage that we as humans have caused. So I think regeneration or responsible tourism, but regenerative in particular, really captures that. And it really shows that we have to change our ways if we as a, as a species are going to survive. So I think that's, that's hugely important. And what we're doing at the Red Sea is seeking to be a, a global benchmark that we hope others will follow. I mean, we work very closely with our colleagues at the other projects, so I think we all share the same ambition and the same desire to, to actually protect and preserve something that's very unique. I think Saudi Arabia has a very unique position in the world where it hasn't been exposed to tourism. I mean, that's, you can say that's good and bad, um, but the, good, so the positive side of that is we have pristine assets. You've got Alula with pristine historical assets. You've got Didier Gate, of course, with the same. And, and we have pristine nature. And so we, we, we're the beneficiaries of the lessons of, of past generations, so we can do things differently. And that's what I think regeneration means. And I think I'm, very, I'm a very big fan of that. Indeed, I'm a big promoter of the very, the very concept of regenerative development. Jerry, to you, are you okay with responsible tourism? Does that describe it enough, or are there other terms that you would bring to the table? You know, uh, when, you're, when you're spending your career in innkeeping, and especially on the marketing side, it's always good to put a label to something. We tend to over-label things because it, it comes out as a new product. And, and I kind of get that because it's realistic. But the one thing that uh, all the CEOs that are working in uh, the kingdom, and you have to really praise the crown prince for attracting uh, the best and brightest uh, minds in tourism, so we do all the things that were done well around the world and avoid the mistakes that we made. I mean, many of us, and you have to praise the Italians because, uh, uh, you know, tourism in Italy is great, but you, you want to raise your hand, you want to raise your fist in the air and, and scream when you see giant cruise ships going down the Grand Canal. It really shouldn't be. And I'm very pro-cruising. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying it's wrong. You know, so... Tourism has to be a vehicle for gathering and welcoming people. Now, a lot of, in my career, uh, a lot of times we had to make stuff up. You know, we had to create fantasy. I'm all for that. Disney, you can't get a more successful company in creating a fantasy. Atlantis and some of my colleagues from Atlantis are here, that's fantasy. Now, at Didea, the birthplace of the kingdom, the ancestral home of Al Saud, that's real. That's 300 years old. So when you're appointed CEO, and especially if you're not Saudi, you have a custodial responsibility to protect that because it should be as pristine 300 years from now. The Red Sea, the brilliant job that John is doing, what the, my colleagues are doing in Neom and Alula, it's got to be as pristine 300 years from now or even better, as John says. So for us, we see it very responsibly. Now, the other thing is that the guy who's the boss, the crown prince, he is a strict environmentalist. And when you use terms like sustainability to him, he doesn't think in those terms. He thinks, what's right? How do we protect it? 
And, you know, a lot, we'll talk about Neom in a minute, but a lot about Neom is what, it, it, it's not just that it's a future city. What's the quality of life for my people and the planet 10, 20, 30, 40 years from now, even beyond tourism? So it's a very exciting time to be in the kingdom because you're driven by a visionary who believes that it is the obligation of the kingdom to ensure that quality of life um, complemented by tourism is done responsibly so it benefits generations to come. Appreciate those thoughts. Uh, Andrew, let's just get your opening statement again. Are you comfortable with the term responsible tourism? It sounds very serious to me, um, and I think Jerry's right, that they're tags, and I think John's right, like it's what do you do about it that actually matters, and so there was ecotourism, there was sustainability, regenerative is the next term. I think a lot of destinations and travel businesses is, have used it as, a, as marketing speak to, to almost greenwash the customer who's looking for it, but I think what you find in Saudi, one of the great advantages of Saudi is it is, it is the unseen. It hasn't had a big tourism industry. So we can learn from the mistakes that places like Venice and Italy have made and actually build a new responsible destination, which is Saudi. Amazing. See the unseen, the untrodden, the unswum. But make sure we develop it for the good. There's a, a, a lot of people, and I've been in the industry for almost 30 years now, that see tourism as the en enemy of conservation, the enemy of... Uh, you know, the environment. It's just not true. So I think what we're all trying to build here is a concept that imagine if travelling was actually better for the planet than staying at home. Because when you come to these places, we've taken care of your emissions, but better than that, you've given back to a local community and you've had a net positive effect. We're rewilding, reforesting, bringing the aquifers back up, celebrating local culture. So to me, that's what responsibility is, and all the people on this panel are actually living it. And finally, let's just get Phil's thoughts as well. Philip, down at the end there, I suppose, when it comes to Royal Commission of our Lula and responsibility to the heritage of the country, is that something that you feel very intently? Indeed. I, I think if you, if you take a step back and, and think about the history of Alula, which goes back 7,000 years, it's been a tourism destination of, of some sort. And our job is to preserve and protect that for future generations for the next 7,000 years. And to do so, it can't just be about protecting and preserving the heritage sites. It's about incorporating the entire community, the residents who live there, the farmers who and teach them new techniques of farming, the local community, send them out to be educated in, in the opportunities that are available in the hospitality industry, and making sure that as we develop our strategy and we implement our plan, that we do so responsibly, sustainably, but at the same time making sure visitors from around the world understand this is not a destination that you can come and, and, and not respect the local community, not respect the 7,000 years of history that we're pre preserving and protecting and then promoting, because at the end of the day, our job is to ensure that this is a, this is a viable industry for many years into the future. Just to that point, I think one thing that all four of you have mentioned is that responsibility to the country of Saudi Arabia, the responsibility to its people as well. And Phil, just starting with you, we'll work back down through. In terms of that, the future, the visions, yeah, we hear about giga projects, etc. But is it key that the interests of Saudi people, the Saudi people are at heart of all of those developments? I think it is, and I'll give you a good example of that. You know, Alula is a small community, 30,000 people. It's, you know, the total population of the county is 40,000 in an area the size of Belgium. So it's sparsely populated. And traditionally, the jobs in Alula have been farming jobs. And, and mostly, if you didn't want to be a farmer, what were your opportunities? So I, I was running one morning in Alula, and this gentleman in an old truck, a farmer, flagged me down. And I thought, oh my gosh, what have I done? You know, I'm running in shorts and a singlet, maybe, you know, he's offended. And so he stopped and he handed me his phone. And it was his daughter, who was a student in Chicago, saying, my dad just wants to say thank you for coming and helping us create a tourism industry in Alula, because we've known this story for many years, but now you're helping us tell the story. And guess what? I'm getting my degree in hospitality in Chicago, and I'm going to come back and work in your industry. So I think that's what this is all about. That's how it really matters. As far as examples go, that's a tough one to beat, but Andrew, give us an example again, if you can, of just 
the impact that it's having, this change? Sure. Well, Neom's in the northwest of Saudi Arabia, 26,500 square kilometres. Jordan above us, and I watch the sunset over Egypt, so an incredible landscape. But it's local opportunity. Um, the, a lot of people that work in my team, my small team of 30 people, are from Tobuk. Uh, we're giving scholarships, as I know a number of other people are, to the best hospitality and other colleges in the world. Um, 30, uh, sorry, 60 something percent of Saudis are under the age of 30. You've heard all these statistics. Women are to the fore. And I think uh, a lot of the women are taking their opportunity, their time is now, and they're incredible spokespeople for Saudi. So this is a bit exciting. I'm actually a bit embarrassed that there's four white males sitting up here because I think the talent in Saudi is phenomenal. And I do think that if I have a legacy, and I'm sure these gentlemen have a legacy, that talent comes to the fore because I think this destination, as people have said, is the time is now. The time is now. And Jerry, given your experience, your global experience as well, have you been able to pinpoint, are there unique challenges that Saudi Arabia face when it comes to implementing responsible tourism at the moment, unique to any other challenges that you've found elsewhere in previous roles? Yeah, uh, there, there is a, a pretty gigantic, unique challenge, uh, which I'll get into in 15 seconds, but I want to join my colleagues in bragging about the young Saudi talent. Uh, we, we're growing pretty quick, all of us now, because we're coming out of design and conceptualization into actual tangible buildings. We all have assets opening uh, shortly, uh, in the next 12 months. But 83% of DGDA staff, which will be 2,000 by June, is Saudi. 36% of our staff are the Saudi female rock stars. 16% of those Saudi female rock stars are in management. And what I'm proud of, which my colleagues have done so beautifully, is 14% of our staff are from the community we serve of Dedea. We have a whole division of Dedea that does nothing but serve our community every day. Because uh, another uh, thing that happens with these giga projects around the world is that they, they spend all this money, but they don't take their community with them. And that's, that's a shame. So we're very, very proud of our team. Uh, the future is very bright, but it's the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. So from a sovereign point of view, it has to be in the hands of the Saudis, which I'm extremely proud of. But there is one challenge that is unique that we're feeling right now, which is the human development side, because you got this dynamic, powerful, vision-driven, highly resourced G20 country that will vault into G20 tourism without the staff. And so all these other mature countries have millions of people in the workforce that we have to do. Now, if you look at Saudi Arabia and you look at the kingdom's commitment to education, there's very few countries proportionately that have put more young people through college than the Saudis. But the Saudis are modest, they don't like to brag. New Yorkers, we brag all the time. So I'll brag for them. They've put millions of people through. So the Saudis are coming home now, fired up, excited about their future. But here's the thing, if you're looking for medical, finance, military, engineers, law, accounting, Saudi's got G20 capability. But when it comes to certain aspects of design, development, marketing, entertainment, the kingdom never emphasized that. So we don't have the generals to execute a G20 vision yet. So then what you have to do is you have to hire expatriates and you have to hire them on people that love Saudi Arabia, that love these young, fired up Saudis. Now, we're lucky because we all do. These are our family. But to get the team to work together on that compressed timetable is challenging. So as we all come out of the ground, the next year or two or three, this is when the human resource issue becomes very important. And I think that if you ask all of us, and we're all very close as a community, the, 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 the CEOs, what keeps us up at night? It's not the vision of the crown prince or his work ethic which is amazing. It's not resources, it's human resources. That's the thing we, we're probably the most concerned about. 
And that opens up, I suppose, another question. I'm hoping that all four of you gentlemen have printed extra business cards, because I'm reckoning you might be handing out a few a little later on. There'll be long queues for them at least. And John, just to that end, I mean, and we've talked vividly about, you know, what tourism and the responsible tourism is do doing, creating an industry within Saudi Arabia. And yet, as we all know, eyes, all eyes are on Kingdom of Saudi Arabia for opportunity. Partners are plenty out there. We'll be looking to get involved. Talk to me about partnerships. How do you go about maintaining responsible tourism, regenerative tourism, and how do you select the right partners to move forward? That's a great question. I think, I think if you start from the premise where you have financial independence, I think put, it puts you in a very different position relative to the private sector. So, and what I mean by that, so for example, Red Sea is fully capitalized. We've got our equity in place, we raised a 14 billion you know, green loan finance facility last year. Um, so all our capital is, is committed. So but having said that, we're, we're quite keen to embrace and bring partnership into, and investors into the, into the project to really provide that seal of, uh, seal of approval, if you will, from the private sector. We launched a large scale uh, public-private partnership to build the utilities infrastructure, which is, you know, unique and, and it's probably one of a kind in the world by, by the very nature that we approached it in terms of a comprehensive package, that brought with it foreign direct investment. So we have people coming to, to us. But because we have this financial independence, we can be selective as to who we would partner with. And it, it would be a partnership. We're not in the business of divesting ourselves and selling land and letting others come and do it. Because of the responsible emphasis you know, to, to protect the environment, we don't want anybody to, to mess it up. So when we talk to potential investors, it's hugely important to us that they share our vision. They share our vision for the environment. They share our vision for supporting Saudi Arabia in its ambition to help diversify the economy away from oil and really to build a sustainable tourism uh, industry for the future, for its population, and, uh, and for the world. And is that key, Jerry? again, uh, leaning on your experience as well, partnering with the right people moving forward to make sure that you are achieving those goals? Uh, it, it's absolutely critical. If one looks at um, just the hotel sector, there was, a, there was a decades where hotel companies owned their hotels or families owned their hotels. And then when uh, the larger companies became global, they started selling off the assets. And then you had the creation of what's called an asset manager. And you talked to, you know, some of the great uh, hoteliers and you, you got them in a the room like uh, our pal Jose Silva there. He'll tell you that uh, a lot of these asset managers only care about the bottom line. They don't think about their guests. They don't think about their staff. All they care about is the return of investment. So now a lot of the hotel operators want to know who the equity partner is. We do. It's very important to the Crown Prince. Now, the other thing about the Crown Prince is that you have continuity of vision. You have one family that has given great leadership to the kingdom for over 100 years. You have work ethic, which is uh, in, in, in on steroids right now. You've got resources, financial resources. The one thing we don't have is time because the crown prince wants to accomplish a G20 vision in a, in a short period of time. So you better know who your partners are, but the Crown Prince will tell you all the time, I know the compression of time is putting pressure on you, but I don't want to sacrifice quality. Sometimes you move fast, like you look at a lot of the building, with all due respect to my wonderful colleagues in China, they move fast, but you look at the quality, you look at some of those buildings, after three years, they look like they're 20 years old. You know? So the Crown Prince is very, he wants the quality and then the environmental protection, the sustainability. Like in, in Derea, we are lucky because we're, the, we're one of the only places in Riyadh that's built on an elevated rock platform above the oasis, above the wadi. Beautiful. In some places, we're 50 meters off the wadi, so when you walk at night in the summer, it's four or six degrees cooler. But in order to put this, the modern technology of water, sewage, irrigation, vertical transportation on buses and 40,000 parking spots, 
We had a core drilled through 8 million cubic meters of rock, 600,000 dump trucks of rock in the middle of Riyadh. Very complex, right? But we have, Riyadh has all the metro stations, like the Emiratis did the great job here. Well, they don't, they don't fit into the Dedea typology. It's not the mud city. We have four metro stations. We had to put them underground. That's a 45 meter dig. That's complex. But he will, he will only go with the quality. So it's, it's a very important point. And I think all of us are under the instructions. If you don't get the right partner, walk away. And we have, by the way. Yeah. All of us have turned down several projects of, of ambitious uh, partners that wanted to come in and provide equity but didn't have the quality. It's, it, it, there are so many questions and so many different avenues we can go down. But I just want to stick with this one if we can, Andrew. Because I'm in, uh, interested, given your sort of experience over in Australia and obviously your experience with uh, indigenous people of Australia and ma maintaining the, the tribal heartlands as well. Again, that... That, that need to sort of move forward and provide infrastructure, but at the same time, honor the, 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 the land that you're working with as well. I mean, we set out on this conversation looking to see if we could set global benchmarks for responsible tourism. But the way you're going about that at the moment, is that also setting global benchmarks? Yeah, I think it is. Um, I, I've got much admiration from, for Dubai and what's happened here. I have much admiration for Singapore and the way they developed. What they didn't do quite so well is 70% of Dubai's reefs are now gone. Singapore's lost all its bird life, all of its natural forests. So I think that, um, and they've lost, I think, a bit of their original authenticity, their cultural heritage. So I think that we can build these great places for the future. Daria is about the heritage of the country, but Neom, uh, is an incredible, it's a crossroads of civilization. When people walked out of Africa, they walked through that land. Two of our hard trails, our pilgrimage trails, are UNESCO whitelisted and they lead down to this incredible place, Salula. So I do think part of responsibility is to protect and preserve the, the heritage. We're a land of the prophets. Both the Quran and the Bible agree that the prophet Moses, peace be unto him, lived in that land when he was exiled from Egypt. What an incredible story. I like to think that he took his inspiration from Neom thousands of years ago. So this is a heritage that's untold, worth preserving. But better than that, it's an opportunity for the people that live there for jobs and for a future, very much like the story that was told. And that's really important. A lot of Saudis, it's a modern country. They don't want to be stereotyped or depicted as Bedouin. That said, the Bedouin culture is alive and well in places like Neom. And it's incredibly interesting to the globe. So if we can preserve, protect that, the environment, bring up the aquifers, reforest, rewild, and deliver a destination that's incredible, but is built on design-led built form, the imagination of the Crown Prince, His Royal Highness and everyone, the world's Imagineers are working with us. And it's not just architects, it's film set designers. It's every creative in the world is coming to Saudi and particularly coming to the places on the stage and helping us imagine a future. So untold heritage story, incredible authenticity, beautiful natural environment meets the tourism of tomorrow. I don't think there's anything better. Just a quick one for, for you, Phil, as well, because I see you nodding away at the end there to what your colleagues are saying. But I just want to pick up on a point that Jerry made about timelines as well. The demand for results. We live in a world that we want results not tomorrow. We want them yesterday, uh, actually. Uh, and yet, the complex nature of the projects that we're talking about, none more so than the Royal Commission of Aldala um, for you, is that something you need to be very conscious of to make sure that results work with the projects that you're working with? Absolutely. I think there's clear expectation that we deliver, we deliver on time, and we deliver on budget. But with that being said, you know, if you look at the Saudi tourism vision and the goal for Vision 2030, it's 100 million visitors by 2030. I only have to worry about 2 million of them. So, because our, our market is very much focused on the luxury premium market, and we're never going to be a mass tourism destination. So that gives us an advantage in the sense that when we look for partners, we can be very discriminating and be very selective. So for example, in Alula, 
we only have five or six certified DMCs who can sell the Alula product. Because what we don't want is a thousand DMCs who don't know the product selling it to the customer base that we're going after. So we can do that across every sector of the industry that, that we're uh, developing to ensure that that level of quality and that level of authenticity is there. And I think that's one of the things that, that is exciting for us is because we know that as we sort of grow this industry from the ground up, as all of us are doing, we have to make sure that we deliver at a level for our target audience so that they're not disappointed. Because if we are going to compete on a global stage, which we are, then we need to make sure we have the assets and the quality of experience that can be competitive. I think he's got a to me and limit. What's your limit, John? You've set a limit. <laughs> Yeah, under a million. So, so poor old Jerry and I have got a bit of heavy lifting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jerry's yeah, got, got to 96 <laughs> by my last count. Now, if, if I could add a... a, a well, can a I just say, just before you do, remember, there's only one Red Sea. There's only, <laughs> that's right. There's only... Right. That's exactly right. I knew, I knew he was going to get me sooner or later. <laughs> right. I'll still close, but there's only one today. No, but uh, here's a point. Um, a journalist recently said to me, Jerry, on the tourism numbers for Saudi Arabia, um, is the goal just the number of tourists? Is, is that why you're going after this? No, 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 no. That's a byproduct of what we're going after. In Dedea, the kingdom has such a bright future. If you look at all the economic indicators, if you look at industry and you look at everything, the future is extremely bright for the kingdom. That's a fact. Look at all the global metrics. And it's one of the reasons why all the super talented young Saudis are coming home at a, at a rate of uh, 150 to 250,000 a year because there's a future, there's promise. Everybody's excited. But when you look at Neom and you look at how exciting that future is, Neom's got to be grounded on a respect and a history and a love and a pride of who you are as a people. That's 300 years old. Now, Alula's got thousands of, thousands of years, but uh, unlike new, in, uh, new nations that came out of nothing, like Singapore, a great example as a model, a Riyadh in the new RCRC, the Royal Commission of Riyadh City, Riyadh will be a, an even better Singapore for 15 million people. In the middle of it is the identity of Saudi Arabia, which is its birthplace, its ancestral home of Al Saud, which is Dereya. So as a people, you're proud of who you are. You're proud of your culture. You're proud of your past, which vaults you into the future. And so much so that thanks to uh, the custodian of the two holy mosques, God bless the king, we made a national holiday recently on February 22nd, founding day, to show that the kingdom is not just September 23rd, that it's 300 years old. So as we look to a beautiful future, very exciting, you're grounded on a national identity, and that national identity, the warmth and generosity unprecedented of the Saudi people in a staggeringly beautiful country, is going to reverse all these old stereotypical uh, images of the kingdom, and no one understands that better than the crown prince. And that's why he said in Vision 2030 that tourism has got to play such a principal role. It wasn't just to attract tourists. It was to show everybody how rich and deep the kingdom is, and especially for the Saudis in terms of national heritage. I think tourism is a... It's soft diplomacy. There's a lot of misconception about Saudi out there in the world. And I think to Jerry's point, when people come, the Saudi culture is, you are a guest in my home. You know, they give over to you. So I think it's a beautiful, gentle people that will, just the people to people nature of tourism is soft diplomacy. So I think it's one of the great advantages of what we're all doing. People will come and see for themselves, make their own mind up. Exciting, exciting time. So exciting. I mean, we could talk for hours up here. Unfortunately, we've all got dinner reservations to get to at some point this <laughs> evening. So, and they don't keep tables for long these days uh, here in Dubai, that's for sure. So uh, to that end, ordinarily we save about 10 minutes uh, for questions at the end. But look, we've got the All-Stars up here, and I'm sure there are plenty of questions on the floor. Hello, everyone. My name is Josh Corder. I'm the Dutch editor for Hotel in the Middle East. Uh, my question is for Jerry. 
Uh, last year, John Pagano said that the Red Sea would cap its annual visitors uh, over fears of over-tourism. Uh, in following on from the mega car park at the rear gate and all of the ambitions to show culture, what is your balance between visitor targets and preserving the natural heritage and will you put a cap on your visitors? Yes, uh, thank you and it's good to see you again and thank you for your, your past kindness. Um, it's a great question. Uh, we are in the principal city, uh, non-theologically speaking. We're in the, the capital of the, a great G20 country with a G10 future. So we're, we're, we're building concentric master plans, 14 kilometers, around the UNESCO World Heritage Site because today is sacred, not in the theological sense of uh, Mecca and Medina, but culturally it's sacred. It's not a theme park. So in order to keep it pristine and to control the visitation to it, we're building concentric circles of hotels and restaurants and university and residences, which will attract to live, work, recreate, pray, shop, visit, get to know each other, over 100,000 people in this today, of, this today of master plan. That will attract 7 million people of the 25 million people coming to Riyadh. Now, in the master plans of the Royal Commission for Riyadh City are all brand new networks of transportation, underground, overground. The Crown Prince has announced Green Saudi, Green Riyadh. These are all initiatives that came out of all of my colleagues' presentations to Royal Court. Today, for instance, we've already planted in our northern region We've already planted a million trees, shrubs, plants. We, we already have our first several parks opening later this year. So those initiatives are not talk. They're, they're happening uh, very quickly. So we have another giga project in Riyadh that's meant for pop culture. The Crown Prince likes the society entertained. He feels that if people are happy and entertained, it'll be a more joyful society. That's Gadea. So Six Flags, you know, it's meant for pop culture. Didea is the soul of the nation. It's the birthplace of the nation. It's the national identity. So we will treat it very pristinely. We will keep it in immaculate condition as it is now, but it's to attract 7 million people annually. Uh, Shane McGinley from um, Arabian Gulf Business Insight. Three of the projects I understand from a tourism perspective, but in terms of NEOM, we generally think sort of robots and flying cars and sort of the future. So what is the tourism concept and what's the investment potential option? Sure, I think I've got most of that. Um, it's a good point. NEOM is more than tourism. That, that NEOM is NEO, new, and Mustakbel, the Arabic word for future, the letter M, so new future. There's 14 sectors we're focused on. So it's the new future of energy, water, sport, health, biotech, etc., and tourism. Um, so, so that's really what we're aiming at. From a tourism perspective, it's a bit like I said, it's how do you build authentically on, off an untold heritage story, uh, an incredible natural environment that shares the Red Sea with John, um, and, and build the tourism of tomorrow. So it's design-led built form. You, you've perhaps seen the launch of the line, uh, 170 kilometre long city with no cars and no roads. Uh, launched by His Royal Highness in January 2021, where transport is all uh, automated uh, vehicles, micro mobility, etc. So no cars, no streets. Carbon capture, net net positive. We launched Oxagon, our port city, which is the future of manufacturing. It's the world's largest uh, floating uh, structure, uh, and it'll be quite incredible. So this is robotics and the future of design and technology incubators for micro Saudi businesses to grow. And just recently we launched Trajina, which is Jabal al Lawr's our highest mountain, 2,600 metres high, where we get natural snow in the winter. We'll man make to complement it. So you'll have ski fields in Saudi Arabia for two to three months of the year. And for the other nine to 10 months, it'll be an adventure tourism paradise. But just go online and have a look at the images of some of the designs of not just the hotel and hospitality assets, but the second homes, the mansions, etc. So this is NEOM, it's, it's taking that great heritage base, that great natural base, 
and designing for the future. I would argue that these destinations, including NEOM, will be the most Instagram places on earth. People will come to see the engineering feats and the physical beauty of these things. Thank you, everyone. This has been outstanding, and it's fun to follow all of your uh, social media. You guys are doing a great job, all of Saudi, and, and projecting this to, to the world. It's incredible. Uh, John, this question is for you. Uh, with the reduction of developed land to preserve natural habitats and environments, and limiting tourists to one million per year, the law of supply and demand will obviously be realized. Will, will this exclusivity have a negative impact on the price point, or will this only cater to the ultra-wealthy and those of means to be able to visit the Red Sea? See what he did there, John. He butted us up, didn't he, with the compliments at the yeah. beginning, and then boom. Look, I think, <clears throat> I think right from the very beginning, when we conceived of the Red Sea, we wanted to position the destination in a manner where we work within our ecological ceiling. And so by, by, that, by that very nature, we decided not to go mass market. Having said that, we have a number of price points to, to, to visit the destination. I mean, I'd say 40 or 50% of the total offer is within the you know, premium category, so we're up or upscale. So that, you know, that's the entry level, and obviously you can go ab above that. Um, so there is pricing that will get uh, you know, more expensive as you move up the chain scale, but, but there's entry level for everybody, normal people, to be able to come and visit the Red Sea. What we don't want, and, and we're going to control this not so much from pricing, but actually from a development perspective. I have, I have I, can, I can say this, we have the largest site of all of the projects in the kingdom. We're 28,000 square kilometers, so we are the largest land area, but we're going to only d develop a relatively small percentage of that. And so the way we're going to control the numbers is by not overdeveloping. I mean, I could easily, I have 200 and two, over 200 kilometers of coastline on the Red Sea project alone. If you, th if you put that anywhere else in the world, you could accommodate tens of millions of people. And yet we're setting ourselves a ceiling of no more than a million and quite probably below that because we're going to proactively monitor the environment using technology and artificial intelligence so that we get early markers and indicators that something that we thought was going to work isn't, and we do something about it before it creates any lasting damage. So it's a combination of not overdeveloping, but I think from a price point of view, I don't think we're pricing ourselves in the stratosphere where normal people can't uh, come and enjoy the beauties of the Red Sea. Perfect. Can you hear me now? No, I'm not sure. It doesn't have to, it doesn't have to do with the responsible to uh, face problem getting people into Saudi, they don't serve alcohol, and so you have this very strict, um, like, um, clothing, attire, and things like that. Again, I think that's one of the things we spoke about a little earlier on, the misconceptions uh, in Saudi yeah. Arabia. Anybody feel comfortable with... I used to live in Saudi Arabia, so... Yeah, no worries at all. They have so mutawah there, so... No, exactly. It's a valid question, and we're just seeing if we've got anyone. Some, come visit Saudi Arabia. The, the, come visit Saudi Arabia. The, the country is changing daily. Um, I think there's some pre, you know, preconceptions as to what Saudi Arabia is. I think my colleagues have, uh, have touched upon it. Um, it's, it's evolving at a pace that I've never experienced in my life before, um, where I think the restrictions that you refer to are no longer present. I think increasingly women don't wear abayas, there's entertainment, there's music, the alcohol question is still outstanding and that's not for this, to, not for this discussion but I think fundamentally the country is opening up and it's embracing you know, a more open society which I think is, is one of the key ambitions of Vision 2030. And by the way, and look, people, look at, look at the abaya. Can women wear a bikini there? Look at the abaya, the abaya is a cool fashion statement now. Have a look at the way <laughs> they dress, it's amazing, you know. Mm. I think it's a really cool part of Saudi's culture and I think it's worth celebrating. I think a lot of, when my family comes over, they'll buy good looking abayas. On alcohol, Saudi um, has a view, Neon will be its own authority, that's not off the table. So I think, I, I listened to His Royal Highness, and he, Saudi doesn't want to westernise. It wants to keep its culture, and I think that's a great thing. But it will modernise. It is modernising. It's modernised. So I think that people, as John said, need to come and see for themselves. These are misconceptions in my view. But by the way, some of them, some of the cultural stuff, clothing, I reckon is a real advantage. Mm. Why do we want to go to the places that are all the same? I don't want to. 
I want to go to a place that celebrates its culture, celebrates its authenticity. Phil, is something you wanted to add? I was just going to say, I think what you're talking about versus what the reality is today is different. I think mean, there's been a change in the mindset in Saudi Arabia where the young Saudis who've traveled around the world, been educated in the US, Europe, elsewhere, they've come back and said, we want for our country what we see there. And you're seeing it change regularly. A lot of the restrictions that you were probably thinking about have gone away. And, and women can dress as long as they do so in a responsible way. They can dress they the way they want to dress. They don't have to wear an abaya. They don't have to cover their hair. They can do what they feel comfortable doing. Same thing applies to the experiences. There's music, there's dancing, there's, there's a whole different sort of vibe to the country today. Mm. I've only been in Saudi for three years and I've seen it change dramatically in the three years that I've been there and it's more to come because the 70% the of the population of Saudi Arabia is under the age of 35. So these young Saudis are demanding change. They're not going to go backwards. They're only going to go forward into the future. And they're going to be part of this transformation of the country that is embracing so many new things, including in the tourism industry. Five years ago, no one would have ever thought of going to Saudi Arabia as a tourist. Today, tens of thousands are coming to, Sa to Alula alone. We had 146,000 visitors last year. So you need to come see for yourself the new Saudi, and I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. I've yet to see a visitor that we've hosted, either a journalist, a tour operator, someone involved in the travel industry who's left going, eh, it wasn't quite what I expected. They all leave going, wow, that's amazing. This is a story we need to tell the rest of the world, and I think you need to be part of that story. And you know, there's, um, there's evidence to that, too. Um, I have the, the, the great honor of sitting on the uh, Saudi Tourism Authority uh, board. And in record time, not only have we put together a, a, a very great ministry of culture with His Excellency Al Khatib, but the STA are doing an amazing job. So we had to do surveys, focus groups, on what people's expectations were of Saudi prior to coming. And there were some very predictable things in, that, in those focus groups. Um, uh, dress and attire, activities, what to do, restaurants, and alcohol did come up. What was really, really interesting is that uh, from a period of September of 2019 to March of 2020, when we had to protect the society due to COVID, we were doing 55,000 electronic visas a week. So when we interviewed people that had, had left Saudi, um, almost all of the things that were on their tick list coming were different in terms of their favorables when they left. You know, like they didn't talk when they came, well, we expect the Saudis to be warm and hospitable, uh, to be festive. We didn't expect the country to be so beautiful. It was up there. And the things that they thought that were gonna be very important weren't even on the list of the post survey. So th this is another one of these perception issues that I think is changing very quickly. Things they are changing, that's for sure. And we're running out of time, so I appreciate the question. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks for all the questions. Wrapping up here with final thoughts from our panelists up here uh, on the stage. And how to, how to frame this. I think we go back to where we started. We started on a road looking for the definition of responsible tourism, regenerative tourism, whatever it might be. Saudi Arabia is on a course to develop a blueprint for what that actually means. And we've set out our own little definition of that. Maybe we can just get your final thoughts as to what that blueprint will look like. I know that's a very wide ending question, but in your, in your, in your vision, John, what does the blueprint for responsible tourism look like in Saudi Arabia? What, I suppose what I'm getting to, what excites you most about the challenges ahead? I think one of the biggest well, one of the things that excites me the most is, is really responding to the previous question. It's, it's, it's to surprise and delight visitors from around the world. Because everybody has this preconception of what Saudi Arabia is. And the country is so diverse, both to, from a topographical point of view, from a cultural and historic point of view, that if, if I'm honest, I didn't appreciate when I, when I first visited. And so I'm looking forward to changing people's perceptions and getting the word to spread around the world that Saudi Arabia is a most, the most one of the most amazing countries in the world. 
and it's an opportunity to come and visit and explore where civilization was born, but delight in its history and its nature and its diversity, and of course the, the famed and fabled hospitality of the Saudi people themselves. I think that's, that's what I look yeah, forward to. Yeah, couldn't put a bit. Jerry, I mean, you've helped build legacies in so many corners of this world. What is the legacy build here? What's the challenge that you, you've put your name to? What excites you most? Yeah, I, I, I think uh, certainly post-COVID. I felt this way way before COVID. It took, it, it took decades. And every decade, I felt stronger and stronger and stronger about it. And if there's labels, and I'm not given a label, but I will reduce it to one word, and that's authenticity. And I will reduce luxury to one word, and that is time. Uh, now people want things that are real, because when they're not real, you can see it and be entertained by it, but you're not moved by it. And people now know that time is precious. The world is precious. The environment is precious. There's only one Earth. So I want to go out, and I want to see what's real, and I want to be engaged in a place that's welcoming to me. I want to feel welcomed. Do you see me? Do you hear me? And that allows people to gather and be global. 300 years ago, people stopped to rest at Derea. And in their resting, it didn't just bring trade. It brought all the great religious scholars. It brought all the great artists. It, it brought scientists of that time. Today it was the, the home of the first school. And by the way, 300 years ago, that school educated boys and girls equally. You know, so in our world now, do you see me? Do you feel me? Does what I say matter? Do I feel welcomed? You know, uh, I'll, I'll end my little piece by saying something that's said billions of times every day. But you say it so fast you don't think about it, right? Someone says thank you. What's the answer to thank you? Thank you, you're welcome. Thank you, you're welcome. Thank you, you're welcome. What, what is the nicest thing you could say to someone after you say thank you? You are welcome. You're welcome. People want to feel welcomed. The world is fragile. Now people are appreciating that. We neglected the earth, now we're paying the price for it. Hurricanes, tornadoes, all this type of stuff. So it's Saudi in its G20, G10 arc, in its brilliant future, the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years, says you're welcome, but we're gonna, we're gonna move in a new sustainable quality of life that enriches not the Saudi experience, but the human experience and celebrated on its rich culture. I think that's a beautiful message. Andrew, your final thoughts on this one? Uh, I think we're having our Steve Jobs moment. Anything is possible. <laughs> you know, we're going to dent the universe. So I'd argue travel and tourism, which has been in my blood for a long time, it's a sea of sameness. And I think Saudi has the opportunity to unlock the explorer in all of us, unlock the explorer and everyone there to find something new. You know, I think this group of people and beyond, there's a lot of other projects going on, by the way, it, we're aiming to forever alter the possibilities of travel. So to me, that's exciting. And the most exciting part we've all talked about it is the legacy it leaves, uh, a new industry for Saudi Arabia, one that will be very, very good at. Appreciate your thoughts. And Philip, final thoughts from you. So to close it out, I'll go back to the beginning where you talked about responsible tourism. 80% uh, of Alula will be a nature reserve. So 80% of the area of the county will be preserved for, you know, for, and protected from any development of any type. And I think that's something that we can all be very proud of. I mean, when they first contacted me about a Lula, a job in Alula, I thought it was Hawaii. I thought, was it in Kauai or Maui? Where is that? And they said, no, it's in Saudi Arabia. And I said, yeah, no. And they said, no, no, you gotta come see it. And when I showed up and looked around at this amazing natural landscape and the thousands of years of history there, and I said, who wouldn't want to be part of this opportunity to introduce this amazing product to a global audience? And that's what we're doing. And it's ex exciting to be part of this overall effort throughout Saudi Arabia. I think it's the, the, the sky's the limit. The potential is amazing. And anything we can do to support that, uh, we look forward to doing. Because I think the future is incredibly bright for this country from a tourism perspective. We certainly look at in safe hands, that's for sure. Whilst Liverpool and England had John, Paul, George, and Ringo, the Fab Four. Saudi Arabia has their very own Fab Four here. Please put your hands together for John, Jerry, Andrew, and Philip. Only one Derea. I like what he said.
I'm happy to be Ringo because he's still alive. <laughs> Big thanks to our panellists uh, who are, of course, uh, with us here at ATM on day one. Thank you very much.